I didn't really want to bring this message today. I had something else in plan, so it'll be tonight. We'll get on that. But this morning, I have to deal with it. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, and thou shalt return to the ground, for out of it thou wast taken. For ashes you are, and ashes you shall return. Then 2 Corinthians chapter 5, what brought this message on was some uh, conversation that I had this week, and to my surprise, a lot of people are pre-planning their funeral by cremation. And I told one man about a few months ago, I said, he said, well, I'm going to get cremated. I said, well, I remember the prophet speaking to dry bones, not ashes. He goes, hmm. And so, look, you can do whatever you want. It's between you and God. But I'm saying cremation's wrong. Now, it's one thing to... There's no easy way to do this. It's one thing to be burned up in an accident, you know, or after you, you physically die, you're your family cremates you and you didn't plan it that way. That's one thing. You're not accountable for that, see? People get ate up in, in the oceans by sharks and blown up in bombs and everything, and there's nothing left. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you as a Christian pre-planning your funeral to cremate your body, and I'm saying that's wrong. Do what you want, but there's consequences. We're going along good now this year, starting off good, yeah. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. So we're going to return to the dust. And another man said, well, you know, the way they, they embalmed the day, that it takes hundreds of years to go back to the dust. So what? Where's the resurrection? The resurrection's coming soon. See? Oh, boy. See, what people do when they cremate their body, I just might as well lay it out. They, they want to evade the grief and the sorrow. And the sorrow is all a process of natural healing. They want to spare the expense of the funeral. And there's all kinds of excuses, but the bottom line is it's a pagan ritual. Now, look at 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1. Boy, I'm going off really good this year. Well, the shoe fits where, you know, that's just the way it is. I said that's the way it is. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved, that means physically dies or expires. We have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So there's a body we live in now, and then, of course, there's a coming resurrected body that we will live in for eternity. Right now, this is our earth suit. This, this is what we live in. But I remind you, the Holy Spirit lives in there. But when our earthly house or our, our body uh, ceases to function and it, it, it dies, like we say, uh, we leave the body, and the body is to be respected. And then drop down to verse 6, please. Therefore, we are always confident that knowing that whether we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. That means the actual literal presence of Jesus. The Lord's with us by the Holy Spirit right now. You understand that, don't you? How many understands that? So when we leave this physical body, the inner man, the real you and me, goes to heaven to be with Jesus and all the rest of the saints and the angels and uh, until the coming trumpet resurrection. And then there'll be a big change. We walk with faith and not by sight. That's what he's talking about. And then we are confident, and I say it, rather willing to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So Paul is saying he would rather 
go on to be with the Lord and just leave the, leave the physical house that he lives in. Our body is a physical house that we live in. In John chapter 5 and verse 25 now, thank you, Lord, for getting started off for a good year this year. The Word of God is like a sword. It cuts this way and that way, so just take your medicine. Amen. Well, you'll take it anyway. John 5, 25. We don't like your attitude. Well, join the club. Jesus said, John 5, 25. The hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear his voice, the Son of God, and they shall hear and live. For as the Father has life in himself, even has he given the Son to have life in himself, he that and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he's the Son of Man. Now, verse 28, very critical. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the urn shall hear his voice. No, all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Amen. Now, I know in the Old Testament they put the, the body in a cave or a tomb, and, of course, in about a year, uh, the... Sinew and this and that would, would rot off and nothing left but the bones. But they would come and get the bones and put them in a box and, and bury them. Joseph had his bones carried and buried where he wanted them to be buried. There was no such thing as cremation. Jesus wasn't cremated. Paul wasn't. No in the New Testament can you show me where there was a willful cremation of a believer. And so those that are in the graves should hear his voice. We would assume then there is part of the body that remains, or at least the seed of the body remains in the earth because the Bible said, dust we are and dust we shall return. Why? Because God said that's the way it is. Now, the reason is the fall. That's the reason. Death is a terrible thing. But in the ministry, we must deal with it, see. Because all of us, if the rapture doesn't come, we will go through this process. And all I can say, if you can't push enough pizzas away to get a few thousand dollars to bury your body, you're sick. Deuteronomy 34 and verse 5. I think about this one lady, she's married three or four times, and she had her husband's ashes up on the mantle of the hearth in the, of the fireplace. That's husband number one, that's husband number two, that's husband number three. There's no such thing as ashes to ashes and dust to dust. That's Catholic. Well, what, what if someone gets burned up? It's not their fault. It's not a problem. But if they willfully choose to burn their body that the Holy Spirit lived in, you've got a problem with faith. Deuteronomy 30, 34 and verse 5. All right. So Moses' servant of the Lord died in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. Now look at this. And he buried him in the valley. Now who buried Moses? God did. God did not cremate Moses. He didn't burn him up. He buried him. Now, if God buried Moses, don't you think we should have enough sense to plan our funeral properly? Do you have your funeral planned? No, not yet. And if you do, I'm thankful for that. Some of you don't want to burden your family with the cost of a funeral. I understand that. But I'm saying cremation's wrong. It's a pagan ritual, and it should not be named among the church. None of you agree. Well, it'd be a terrible thing to burn your body and then go down to a burning hell. Is there a choice in it? 
the Bible is great in this area. But I'm saying this preacher leans toward a proper burial and a proper funeral. But nowadays, they don't even have a funeral in our fair country, in our county. No sermon, no acknowledgement of God Almighty, not even a graveyard, graveside service, just a cremation, and let's get on with the program. That is wrong. Boot me off of Facebook. I don't care. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 now and verse 16, and I'll tell you, if I go before my wife, she's not here so I can say this, okay? If I go before her treat me and she cremates me because she can save a few thousand dollars, I will send the lightning bolt down. <laughs> and I'm taking care of business. <laughs> don't say you can't do it. You don't know what God might allow, <laughs> all right? It just grieves me. Now look at this. How many can accept this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17? Now look at it. Straight on. Know ye not that you are the temple of God? The temple is your body. I said the temple is your body. I know we have problems, infirmities because of the fall and aches and pains and things that go wrong. Sometimes we have to need maintenance. But still, the Holy Spirit lives inside of your body, and He is connected to your inner man, your spirit, and your soul. And I had this question come to my mind, does God leave the body when you die? Oh, how many want to know? Oh, you're way out there now, preacher. Am I? He knows those are in the grave. Now look, know you not you're the temple of God and you're, the Spirit of God dwells in you. That's just what I'm saying. The Spirit of God dwells in you. Where is he at? Inside your temple, which is your body. The Word of God can quicken our mortal bodies and make our bodies alive and heal our bodies and this and that, but we're still aging because of the fall, and that's life. And then the next verse says, now, this is tough. Can you take it? If any man defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now, I've wrestled with this subject almost as much as divorce and remarriage in 40-some years. And I can tell you, one way to look at this word defile is destroy. So I could read it this way, if any man destroy the temple of God. And I take that as suicide. Now, there are exceptions. If, if only God can judge this. We don't judge, but we do have to lay it out for you to decide. If, if a Christian, a real Christian, goes off mentally, all right, and not responsible for his or her actions and would happen to overdose willfully or accidentally, let's say willfully, or one guy shot himself in the head, killed himself, and uh, did he go to heaven? Well, if he wasn't responsible for his actions, yes, he did, if he was a Christian. But we're really straining the gnats here. And so I took that first as suicide, but then secondly now, this is really tough, we need to push away the Twinkies, Brother Monty. <laughs> because now they have, oh boy, I'm really in trouble. Now they have understood that being obese brings on cancer. Aha! So now we've got to push away the Twinkies and the fried chicken. Ever said, Lord, help us. Because we've got to take care of our body. Because the body belongs to God. Listen. You don't belong to yourself. Your body belongs to God if you're a Christian. He'll decide when we die. We do not euthanize old people or kill babies in the womb. No. Only God can decide when a person is ready to leave the physical body. I can't do that. 
because it's a serious thing, and I've got to deal with it serious this morning. If we defile that temple of God, God will destroy us. Now, look, there's things we've got to get rid of this year. God's warned us and warned us and warned us for years and decades, and we're still holding on to weights that's harming our physical body. Like, for example, we're not getting enough sleep. Now, I'm preaching to myself. Too much stress releases too much glucose, and then you get a metab metabolic disorder. Huh? On and on we can go. And we like to shift the blame. Well, you know, the food's no good. I know the food's no good we're eating. But I think we can help ourselves a little bit by being more attentive to what we're eating. That's pretty good. Can I say it again? All right, well, I'm preaching to myself. I mean, that, that strawberry shortcake... Uh, that strawberry shortcake your wife makes, I just cannot. I've got to get one or two spoons of that, you know, every time she makes it. She makes it for me, just so I'll sin. <laughs> not really. But, you know, none of us are perfect. I'm not making excuses. But I'm saying we can do better this year. Like one guy said, he needs to get 10 pounds off each joint. Hmm. <laughs> Dear Lord. Well, God help us, you know, but we don't want to purposely defile our body. I need to drink more water. I'll admit that. Years ago, I got hooked on Diet Pepsi. You know, people that's overweight, Diet Pepsi and a donut, always. But Diet Pepsi causes brain cancer. I mean, for years, I was hooked on that. No water, all Diet Pop all the time. And finally, I, the light came to me, the truth, and I got rid of it. I don't drink it. Maybe an occasion, but, you know, I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't practice doing it. So we, we learn as we grow. But we've got to take care of our physical body because, listen, nobody else is going to take care of you. I can't tell you when to take an aspirin. can't tell you when to put Bengay on your neck. Come on. My wife don't like Bengay. Well, my wrist has been bothering me, and I'm human too, and I get out to a Bengay. It smells good to me. She don't like it. Well, go in the other room then. So I can preach that way when she's not here, right? I like being gay. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So would you agree with me that the Bible teaches definitely that the Holy Spirit lives in our body? How many agree with that? Well, he's with your spirit, but he's inside of your body, and your spirit is inside your body. Now don't tell me you're with us in spirit and in home. No. Your spirit does not leave your body and come to church when you leave your body home. You see, you tell your body what to do. You got up this morning and told your body, I'm going to go to church. Body says, I don't feel like it. Shut up. We're going to church. And then your body must succumb to what you decide to do. Can't blame anybody else for what you do with the body. Now, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, man, I'm going slow today. Well, it'll get better, maybe. Let me find it here. Praise the Lord. All right. What? Wait a minute. Oh, why? Okay. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, that you have of God, and you are not your own. Therefore, you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body, in your spirit, which are God's. Now, if you're a Christian, I mean a real Christian, your spirit and your body belongs to God. I said you were bought with a price. The price was God's own son on the cross. He bought and paid for us, spirit, soul, and body. We belong to him. Our spirit's been resurrected. Our soul is being changed. And our body is waiting the trumpet, the sound, to receive glorification. And that's the final act of salvation. Right now, we're heading that way, but we're still in the physical body. Nevertheless, it still belongs to God. Now, in Psalms 139, let me calm down. Psalms 139, verse 7 to 8. Psalms 
Whether shall I go from thy spirit, or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. Hello. I said hello. Now, one way to look at this is that hell means the grave. I don't think God's Holy Spirit in the lake of fire are in torment side of hell right now. That's lost. No, there's no Holy Spirit there. But if a believer's body is laying in the grave, it seems to me the Holy Spirit, oh, God, thank you. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave us. <laughs> I know things change. But he knows those that are his that's in the grave, that's going to come out. The Holy Spirit is going to bring them out. <laughs> it's a comfortable thing to know that when I'm in the coffin, God forbid, I won't be by myself. I'll be asleep. I won't know anything about it. But God keeps a record. Praise God. Say amen now. Man, that's a good thing. Hallelujah. Mom and dad's gone. My sister's gone. The body's been laid in the grave out of Tracy Church. I had the lady that, that watches over the graveyard. She said, well, now, if you and your spouse, you and Tribby wants to get cremated, we could put both of you in one plot. I said, we? Isn't that great? I said, no, we'll take this plot for me, that plot for her. That's as far as I've got. You going to make a tombstone? No. If my kids can't make a tombstone, I've failed in being a parent. I know some of you made your tombstones. Fine, God bless you. But if I made mine and put it out there where I might lay someday in the physical and put my name there, I'm opening up the devil to kill me. Take it for what is matter. You know, you can do what you want. I'm just saying, I'm not even going to put a rock there. Hey, man, maybe it doesn't mean a thing. You better listen to the Holy Spirit a little bit. Aha, uh -huh. boy, I'm on a nerve today. I'll tell you what. Well, Sheol is the Hebrew word. Righteous are not abandoned to it. Did you get that? The righteous ones are not abandoned to Sheol, which is the grave. That's only one way to look at it. That's where I'm looking at it right now. So God doesn't forsake us just because we die. I need to say it again. God does not forsake us. He does not forsake our physical body just because it dies. Can you prove it? Absolutely. But we'll get to that in just a minute. My question was, does the Holy Spirit depart of the believer at physical death? That's my question. God is omnipresent. He's present in heaven. He's present on the earth. And he's present in the grave. Now, there's no activity in the grave except God knows where you are, and he said he'd never leave you nor forsake you, and we'll get to that. Look at 2 Kings chapter 13. For just one uh, in instance here in the Scripture about a person that died, and yet God was with him even though he was dead. Well, where are you getting this at? It's in the Bible. 2 Kings 13, let's look at it now, in verse 20 and 21. So Elijah was a, a great prophet of God, anointed with a double portion. But Elijah died. And verse 20, and they buried him, and the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming end of the year. And it came to pass, now this is, some time went along here, see. It came to pass that as they were burying a man, that behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elijah. Now, Elijah was dead. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elijah, so he'd been there quite a while, he revived and stood up on his feet. Now, you can't tell me the Holy Spirit was not with Elijah the prophet, even though he was physically expired. 
You know what? Sometimes we're not appreciated until after we die. Oh, he was a great preacher. Oh, great. Oh, he was a good man. Oh, yeah. Uh, but you're not appreciated when you're alive. Just when you die, sometimes we can make more of an impact on the kingdom of God after we're gone. So we need to set a good example if we were to leave by the way of the grave and be a witness. Now, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20 and 21. Can we be a witness at death? Yes. Mm -hmm. Philippians 3.20, for our conversation is in heaven. Now, we abide on the earth. Are you listening now? We abide on the earth, but we belong in heaven. There's a reason why we're here. One reason. We look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. We sure do look for him to come back. Amen. Why? Who shall change our vile body? This body, even though you have Max Factor and Vidal Sassoon, is still vile. If you don't believe me, the next time you overeat and you need to go down to the men's room or the men and women's room, you will soon re remember how vile this body is. That's graphic. That's the way it is. We even have to wear deodorant. Well, I don't, but I mean, a lot of you do. <laughs> i got to tell this story. John came up from Kenya years ago, and they, uh, oh, yes, and they don't wear, they don't wear deodorant like we do. God bless you guys. But my wife, see, John stayed in her house, okay? And Seth will remember vividly. And so my wife goes and buys this big bunch of aftershave and cologne and deodorant and soap and all kinds of stuff. And there's a nice package. And he gives it to him. Does he use it? No. He just takes it back home and sells it. <laughs> Moving right along here. Do you have bad breath? <laughs> no, huh? I can't smell a thing. Well, if you eat garlic... Or uh, who gave me some uh, jerky? It's good jerky, but it had garlic in it, you know. And, and uh, when you're praying for people, you've got to be sure and have search or gums because you don't want to knock them down with a bad breath. Right? <laughs> oh, we don't have that. Do you ever get your teeth filled? Huh? I got one right now. I'm going to have to go see the, the vet about that. Praise God. You know, we go through life one time. We might as well have a good time. We can go through, oh, it was me, or we can go through and have a good time because we're going to go through once. That's it. So he shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like to his glorious body. He's able to subdue all things unto himself. And so the final act of salvation is when we believers that are in the natural body now receive a glorified body like Jesus that is a final act of salvation. And the way we know we're going to receive that blessing for eternity is we have the down payment, the new birth, right now. The Holy Spirit knows those that are His. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's go to Hebrews 13.5 now quickly before I get stoned today. I shouldn't have talked about a raise for the pastor because it's not going to work right now, all right? But No, nobody's ever hired me yet. I don't know. Let your conversation, now look at this verse, please. Let your conversation be without covetousness or coveting, you know, and be content with such things as you have. How many can say, yes, okay, I'm content? That's kind of weak. It's kind of weak. 
I'm content with such things as I have. For he said, here it is, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, you is also physical. I don't know if you're getting this or not. Where do we get the idea, even when we get to heaven, that the Holy Spirit leaves us? No. The Holy Spirit will never leave us for all eternity, and the church said amen to that. But I'm suggesting today, he also is mindful of our physical body that's in the coffin. Then we go to Acts chapter two and verse or Acts chapter eight and verse two. So God is not going to leave us or forsake us. So I'm saying right now, I'm confessing right now, whether you accept this or not, if I were to go by the way of the grave, the Holy Spirit would be with my body, even though it's asleep. Why? He's omnipresent. You want to be buried alone? trying to scare me. Folks, I'm telling you the good news, and why is it that you're struggling with this? Because you've been infected by the ways of the world, thanks. We're not of the world. Amen. I mean, it's Wigglesworth would go down to the morgue and hit somebody in the belly and bring them back from the dead. That's what I call a prophet, big time. Well, the Holy Spirit had to know where the dead corpse was. Acts chapter 8 and verse 2, it's almost like pulling wisdom teeth today. So Stephen preached this great sermon, man, one of the greatest sermons in the New Testament. Boy, did he hold a garden. You're murderers. You kill the Holy One. And so he got the religious crowd upset, and they stoned Stephen. You know the account. How many knows the account? And so Stephen died. He called upon the name of the Lord, and he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, and lay not this sin to the charge. And when he said that, now this is a hypothesis, when he said that, Saul was over there, and that allowed Saul to be saved. Now, never, not everybody was saved. But Saul was because of Stephen's confession. That's what I'm saying. So Stephen died at the rock concert, and devout men carried Stephen. Everybody said devout. Devout men carried Stephen to his cremation. No, to his burial and made great lamentation over him. They buried him. Everybody said buried. Now, it's a wonderful thing to have devout, holy men to carry your body to be laid to rest. They were spiritual. They were men that reverenced God Almighty, holy. I'm saying when I preach a funeral, God forbid, but when we do, we are paying our respect to the one that's departed. But we get the gospel in anyway. In other words, these men that were carrying Stephen's body were honoring the temple of the body. They honored the body that Stephen lived in because the body that Stephen lived in was the temple of the Holy Ghost, the earth suit, he lived in until the will of God was completed, and then he left the body in the will of God. I know it was the will of God for him to be martyred because he looked up and saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. See? Stephen was the first one welcomed in to glory. Nevertheless, his body was laying in the grave, awaiting the resurrection. And in that sense, the Holy Spirit knows exactly where the remains of Stephen is. These men that carried his body were loyal to God and had respect for Stephen's remains. That's what I'm saying. We should respect those that are departed, that have died in the faith. We should honor them. 
and not desecrate their funeral by burning them. That's what I'm saying. Besides that, at the crematory facilities, they put one to three corpses in there on the same slab and burn them to ashes, but then the bones are still remaining, and so they got to chop them up in a blender. And now the guys that are eating hot dogs and drinking Pepsi divide the ashes. Well, this guy was 300 pounds. We'll put more over here. And then this one, you don't know whose ashes you even got. Well, they save money by burning up three corpses. Folks, do what you want. But I'm just saying, if you purposely tell the mortician to cremate your body, you're sinning against the Holy Spirit tabernacle that he used to live in and still has control of. That's what I'm saying. Is it a sin? I don't know, but it's not bringing glory to God. In Joshua chapter 7 and verse 22, Joshua 7, 22 to 25. So Joshua sent messengers and ran into the sand. Now, this is when Achan coveted and he, he stole some gold and this and that. And Israel was suffering because of the sin of coveting. Are you following me? So jo Joshua found out. He sent messengers and they ran into the tent. And behold, it was hidden the tent, the silver under it. They took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them to Joshua and to the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. Joshua, all of Israel with him, took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them into the valley of Achor. Now verse 25 is the kicker. And Joshua said, Why hast you troubled us? The Lord shall trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire. Cursed. After they stoned them with stones. So they killed him and his family. Terrible thing. You, you would think that God would have forgiven because he, he, he confessed and he said, Yes, I did it. I'm sorry. But nevertheless, under the law, the penalty was death. And they burnt them, which signifies a curse. I'm saying when the children of Israel caused their, caused their children to pass through the fire and sacrifice their kids to the false god Moloch, they were sinning. And God was upset. Because you destroy that temple and God will destroy you. I used to preach this way all the time. And now the church has really grown in leaps and bounds. No, it hasn't. It's gotten smaller. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 14. Well, we can do what we want. Yes, you can do what you want. But don't avoid the nudge of the Holy Spirit to do what's right. That's quenching, and now you've got a problem with truth. Well, you can't prove it either way. I think I'm making my case. Jeremiah 15, verse 14. Where's Jeremiah. I will make thee to pass with thine enemies into the land which thou knowest not. For far as kindled in my anger, it shall burn the lowest hell. Fire. Then Deuteronomy 32 and verse 22, to back that one up. A fire is kindled in mine anger, it shall burn the lowest hell. And shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. So it seems to me that most of the time, now not all the time, we're not talking about the fire of the Holy Ghost here, but the Bible does say our gods are consuming the fire, and it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. So it seems to me if we're going to make a rational decision, I lean standing away from cremation because it signifies a curse from fire. So I'm saying. Burning seems to represent a curse on people. And to repeat, it's paganistic. Now, my aunt, she's still alive in California. She said, well, it, it, it's, it's just so wonderful to, to take the ashes and, and to scatter them over the ocean and 
It's so spiritual. No, it's not. It's not spiritual at all. Yet I know people in our county that's had their ashes scattered over McDonald County. God help me. I don't want to stay here forever. <laughs> I know a guy that went to Nazarene Church. Great guy. He died and had a cremation planned. They took his ashes and buried them by the side of the door when you go into the church building. I don't understand the thinking. Where is this thinking come from? Well, one thing is people don't want to admit there's a God. This person that died here uh, last week, I've known my whole life, no funeral, no nothing, not even anything on the, you know, is it on there? Well, we're glad it's on there, but yet still, I preached a funeral a few years back, and this man I'm talking about, I won't call his name, he's gone now, but there was an emotional outburst in the crowd because I was hoeing the garden with the gospel. Well, that's the way it is. Those people don't go to church. They need to hear the truth and so they can have a chance to be saved. Don't you agree to that? I said, it's abrasive. I know that. But then it shows us that we need the Savior. See? And this man that passed away comes up to me and shaking hands like they do with the preachers, you know. Some of them snob and walk away, but God's the judge. And he said, Randy, what you said today was true. He gave a mental assent to the truth of the gospel, but yet, as far as I know, he didn't accept Christ as Savior and Lord. I hope he did, but I don't know. Now it's cremation time. People want to get away from the, sor the sorrowfulness. And, you know, when the Jewish people died, they mourned for like a month, a week or more, and left the body in the house. That's the reason my mom passed away. She said, I don't want anybody looking down on me. Look, I understand that. But they, they paint you up, the remains. Did you let people look down at your mom's face? Yes, I opened it up the casket. She didn't want me to, but I did. Well, she's gone now. She was gone, so I could do what I want, right? But I feel like when a believer passes away, we need to have the funeral in the church. Not down there where all the demons are. There needs to be a funeral of respect for those that lived their life for God their whole life and served God 110%, was saved by the blood and filled with the Holy Ghost. Their name is in the book of life. They left the body, and the body goes to the grave to wait the resurrection. We lay the body in the hopes of the resurrection from the dead. They're rejoicing in heaven now in the spirit form. How can we get away from that? It's sinful. So I was saying we believe in the physical resurrection of the body to come. Amen. I know there are exceptions to the rule. But it seems to me that some have the concept that if they cremate their loved one, they don't give anything for God to resurrect. Wrong. God is, knows where everything is, seen and unseen, visible, invisible. When the trumpet sounds, all the molecules are coming back because the seed is there. Now, Daniel went on to say, some will receive the resurrection of good and some the damnation. So everybody, no matter whether you're cremated or not, it's going to be resurrected. I'm saying if we abuse this temple by an act of our own will and stupidity, God's got somewhat to say to us, come judgment day. Now you choose. Let's stand up today. I've delivered my soul. Praise the Lord. I'm not going to say any more about it. But if you cremate your body, I'm going to go up there and dump the ashes out on the floor.
Praise the Lord. And then we're going to get your vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Folks, it's just sick. Do what you want. After all, it's ashes to ashes and dust to dust. No, it's not. There's no such thing as ashes. Have you got the little message, whether you like it or not? I've delivered my soul, now you judge. 